Welcome, middle school. Uh, we are happy to have our first alumni speaker series of the year. Um, this was, of course, supposed to happen in December, and then we know we ended up having the day off. So now we're here. Um, so we have a wonderful panel of speakers who are alumni of SCH um, who are here today to talk about their experience, both in their time at CHA, Springside, SCH, um, as well as how they advance through their careers. Um, all of our panelists have careers in the science, technology, engineering, and math field. Um, and it's a very wide array of experiences that they're gonna share. So um, we're really excited to be able to have these individuals share with you today. Um, a note for teachers, advisors, or virtual students, if anybody in your classroom has questions along the way, you can just type them into the Q&A box down below. Um, and then our wonderful student council leaders are going to help facilitate the Q&A. So each speaker is going to go through their slides, share their story, and after each speaker shares their story, we'll have time for questions and then we'll move on to the next speaker. So with that said, we have our lovely um, two of our student council leaders today. We have Aaron, who's going to introduce each speaker to you. And then we also have Ayana, who will help lead the Q&A. All right, so Aaron, over to you. Uh, our first guest speaker is Taikish Keys. Uh, he graduated from CHA in 2011. He attended Morehouse College, a historically black college and university and Columbia University to obtain a dual degree in physics and mechanical engineering. Ty later obtained a master's of science degree from the University of Southern California in systems engineering. Uh, he currently works as a design engineer for the Boeing company. In this role, he helps design, manufacture, and test helicopters for the US military. Ty is also working to find helpful ways to use 3D printing technology on various aircrafts. All right, thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Aaron said, my name is Taikish. I also go by Ty, so that's perfectly fine. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit more interesting things about myself if you go to the next slide. Um, so one thing about me, I'll start right here in the middle, is that I absolutely love sports. Totally biased to Philadelphia, so Sixers, Eagles. I'm not much of a Phillies fan, but I remember in 2008 when I was uh, at CHA and they won the World Series and we all went crazy and everyone went downtown to the parade. It was, it was an amazing experience, but I can more vividly remember the Eagles won the Super Bowl and going down to that parade. So I always really enjoy going to sporting events, watching it on TV. I also love the travel and I'll take you a little bit around the slide here. So one of the first pictures is me actually in the Dominican Republic on an ATV tour. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. It was a fun experience for me. Um, at the bottom there is, out, is me and my wife um, in Mexico. Um, in the middle is a, is a concert. It's actually the On The Run tour, um, Jay-Z and Beyonce. Huge Jay-Z fan myself. Um, I try to go to all concerts if I can. Hasn't been able to get to as many as I would like to. Um, hopefully I'll be able to in the future. And then uh, on the right-hand side is a picture of me um, and my first time at Toronto. And then the bottom was actually my last trip to LA. We actually got to go do a little bit of hiking. So outdoor activities, traveling, some of the things I actually absolutely love to do. Next slide, please. So a few fun facts about me while I was CHA. So I actually started in fourth grade. So unfortunately I am not a lifer. Um, I wish I was, I used to try to wear it as a badge of honor, but uh, I started in fourth grade. Uh, during that time I played football, basketball, lacrosse. I started all those in middle school and I kind of continued to on through high school. Uh, my favorite trip was sixth grade sailing trip. I'm not sure if you all still do the sailing trip, but it was so much fun. Um, I enjoyed kind of that feeling of independence, being out on the water. It was a lot of fun, really relaxing. Um, I got my boating license. I really enjoyed that. And uh, last but certainly not least, I am team light blue all the way. So that's me. Next slide, please. So as I stated before, I started at CHA in uh, fourth grade. So after I graduated, I actually went all the way to Atlanta, Georgia to Morehouse College, which is a historically black college and university. And 
they don't actually have an engineering program, but they do offer a dual degree program in which you can major in physics and engineering. So you start off by doing three years at Morehouse and you major in physics and you graduate with a physics degree and then you actually transfer to one of their partner schools. I actually chose Columbia to finish my mechanical engineering degree. So I spent three years in Atlanta at Morehouse and then I spent another two years uh, in New York City going to Columbia University. Um, both very different schools. Morehouse is very small school. I would say my graduating class was about 400 students total in the entire university. Um, the engineering department at Columbia was about 400 students and my graduation was thousands of students. So there's a big difference there, but I enjoyed the balance of having two different experiences. Um, so I would recommend it. I totally enjoyed it. And I actually, during the summer, that opportunity to teach for one summer, I did research at Georgia Tech University. I um, also did research at University of Pennsylvania before doing an internship at Boeing. Um, and I enjoyed my time at Boeing, so I decided to start there full time after I graduated. Once I started at Boeing, um, I was there for about two years and I decided to go back to graduate school to get a master's degree in systems engineering uh, while still working full time to kind of learn a little bit more, learn a different skill set, and hopefully um, become a better engineer in the process. And uh, my, my last thing is kind of the plane taking off because I'm still relatively new in my, in my current career. I've been working full time for about five or six years now. So I think I have a pretty long ways to go. So hopefully uh, more adventures are to come and I've been enjoying the journey so far. I'm looking forward to what comes next. So what is it like to work as an engineer? So I majored in mechanical engineering and I didn't actually think I would go into aviation or working in the defense industry, but I uh, had so much fun during my internship, I decided to come back. So I worked, my first job was actually working on the Chinook helicopter, um, which you see on the top left-hand corner, which is actually a tandem rotor helicopter, which makes this helicopter unique is that your traditional helicopters only has one set of rotor blades. Here you see we have two, one in the front, one in the back, and it allows it to actually get a lot more power and lift a lot of heavy things. Here you see it lifting a Jeep. It's actually strong enough that it, a Chinook can actually carry another Chinook, which is about 5,400 pounds. So it's a, it's a pretty strong helicopter. So it was a lot of fun to work with. Now I currently work on um, a, the future long range attack aircraft, which is a developmental program, which is the one you see right next to it. So there's only one of these in existence. Um, this is totally developmental. I work on this, this is the prototype and this is actually a coaxial. So instead of having one set, they're actually stacked on top of each other, which allows it to go faster than any other helicopter in the world. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we also have a prop rate on the back to make it go even faster. So I've enjoyed my time working on this. So every day is a new experience. So I get to pick out different materials. I get to work in the lab. I get to work with a whole bunch of very, very smart people from different parts of the world. Um, I get to travel a lot. In the bottom, you see me in my oversized blue suit here. And this is actually uh, one of the flight test suits. So I've had the opportunity to fly in the aircraft. So you have to put this on so people can see you from really far away. I enjoy being able to fly in the aircraft. I enjoy being able to work in different materials. Um, we also work in an additive manufacturing. So how do we make things that used to be five pieces down to one piece by being able to use a 3D printer? How do you 3D print different materials? So I, you get to be very creative in the engineering space and work with a lot of different people and different specialties. So I enjoy it. And on the right, just for scale, this is actually me standing in front of an engine of a 747 just to show you how large these engines can actually be. And that's just one component that goes into an entire aircraft. So every day as engineers, it's fun, it's exciting, and I continue to learn every single day. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, so, so that is the end of my presentation. So I wanna thank you all for having me today and feel free to ask me any questions. All right, Ayana is going to lead our Q&A. Hi, so um, a question that we have for you is how do you test the helicopters? So we, we test the helicopters by going through a series of tests. We've actually been testing the one aircraft that I just showed you for about two and a half years now. So after we do a design, we start off by testing all the materials. So we might take 
a single piece, may that be like a piece of metal, and then we'll, we'll bend on it, we'll pull it, we'll see how long it takes to break, and then we'll try to do a bunch of parts put together, we call that an assembly, and then we'll do a similar process in which we'll try to break it, um, and then learn from that, and we use things called strain gauges and a bunch of different uh, tools to measure the forces that are going on on aircraft. Then once it's all put together, we start the fun testing. So we might start off by going maybe 10 feet off the ground and hover, and then we slowly expand and go a little bit more each time. So we may go maybe 50 feet and come back, and then maybe 100 feet and come back until we're able to feel confident that we can go higher and further, and we do it in the steps. And it takes about three to four years to fully test a brand new aircraft. We have another question, which is, what is your favorite part of your job? I think my favorite part of the job is flying in the aircraft. It's, it's one thing to kind of have your paper and, and you're sitting in front of a computer and you're creating these designs but it's really cool to finish a product and you're able to sit inside the aircraft and actually fly inside something that you know that you've designed and that you've helped to build and you get to go really fast. So I enjoy that as well. Thank you. Um, back to you, Aaron. Uh, our second Sorry, real quick. I think there's actually just a couple other questions here. Um, Ayana, do you wanna take those? Okay, yes, sorry. Um, how has your experience at SEH helped you achieve your current position in your career? Okay, so when, when I was in high school, I actually did not think I was going to go into engineering. And I actually took a intro to engineering course um, with Mr. Irvin. I'm not sure if Mr. Irvin is still there, but Mr. Irvin was my intro to engineering teacher. And we also did first robotics. So learning about engineering from Mr. Irvin, being able to be in first robotics, to be able to code things, to design things in, in CAD software, to build things really sparked my interest in engineering, which made me want to look at it more in the future. And even today, I still have some of those principles from being able to build things in the lab, from that hands-on experience that's helped me today in my career. Do you have any advice for our middle school students? Yes, I think, I think the best advice is to try to have fun. Um, I know school, there's a lot of tests and homework and things of that nature, but um, try to find something that you enjoy and, and have fun with it. It's, it's a lot of fun where you're able to see how all the things that you're learning comes together, how it creates things that are really beautiful rather than um, writing a book or being an athlete or being a doctor or being an engineer or a musician. Um, Find your passion and, and make sure you enjoy it. Uh, thank you so much, Ty. Um, our second speaker is Stacy Perper Methvin. Uh, she graduated from Springside in 1975. At Princeton, uh, at Princeton University, she majored in geology. After graduating, she was recruited by Shell Oil Company, where she worked for 33 years. Stacy drilled oil and gas wells in the Gulf of Mexico, California, Michigan, Texas, and Louisiana. Then she served as president of a large refinery in Houston and then president of the Shell Chemicals business in North America. In her current role, she travels the world to meet with her staff in Singapore, London, Philippines, Thailand, Germany, Italy, and China. Thank you very much, Erin. Really appreciate the introduction. Let me go ahead and tell you all about a uh, little bit more about me and about my career. And it's really exciting to be with everyone uh, here this morning. So next slide. Let's start with a little bit about me. Um, as you can see in that upper left-hand picture, I grew up as one of four children. I was the second oldest. My sister and I went to Springside. It was just called Springside at the time. And my two brothers went to Penn Charter and that was um, an all boys school at that time. After um, leaving Springside, I went to Princeton University as Aaron mentioned. And then I started work with Shell Oil Company as a geologist in New Orleans. When I went to Shell, I actually met my husband on the very first day of work, which was wonderful. 
And we, he was from Louisiana. And so we eventually bought a home or built a home up in Northern Louisiana on a river. And you can see the picture of a sunset one evening uh, along the river in Louisiana. We love to spend a lot of time there, even though now I actually live full-time in Houston, Texas, which hopefully some of you have been to Texas one day. Uh, after um, uh, New Orleans, Shell sent me to California and my husband and I had one son that was born in California. And he is now shown in that upper picture with his wife. And they are actually at Machu Picchu in Peru, but they, but they do live in Indiana. So they really live in the United States. My husband and I love to bike. We're a lot like Ty. We love outdoor activities. We go all over the world doing things. Um, so in the bottom left, you can see this past summer, we bicycled all around Crater Lake, which is quite a day's bicycling trip and a lot of big hills. In the bottom right, um, while we were at Crater Lake, we went to a nearby river and got to go rafting, which was really wild and crazy. Um, in addition to all my travels and outdoor fun, I'm very active with the Houston Zoo. And in the upper right picture, you can see me um, this past summer, we were able to release a sea turtle that had been found after a really big freeze down here in Texas last February. And that sea turtle nearly died in the freeze, but we um, got him and he stayed at our vet clinic until June. And then I got to release him back into the bay and he's doing great today. If you go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about my time at Springside. So this is me in middle school. You can see my little identification card. And that's with my best friend after the maypole dance. I think y'all still do that maypole dance. That was really fun. I was a chestnut or a gold when I was at Springside. Next slide. So this is a bit more about some fun facts about what I, what I did at Springside. So we had a class of 47 girls. We were all best friends. I loved my class. Um, we were so active together and went on a lot of adventures. I played a lot of sports. Um, I played field hockey in the fall. I played basketball in the winter. Um, I think our basketball team, I was trying to remember, I think we were undefeated for three years, uh, which was just so much fun. I played lacrosse when I was in middle school like you, but when I went into upper school, I ended up playing tennis in the spring. I also played in the orchestra, um, both the flute and the piccolo. And then outside of school, I was very, very active. I was on a YMCA gymnastics team that competed nationally. And I also traveled with my family during the summer to all the national parks um, where we were able to go hiking. And I went to overnight camps to uh, get better at tennis. My favorite subjects were always math and science, but I really was pretty much uh, curious about all my subjects. And we did have classes with CHA uh, beginning in ninth grade, and I made a lot of great friends with our fellow CHA class. So next slide. So this is a bit about my journey. So I told you a little bit about Springside and then I went on to Princeton University. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to major in. I thought I wanted to be a doctor uh, because I love the sciences and I thought I'd wanna um, work with children. But then geology became so interesting to me. One summer I became a national park ranger at Olympic National Park. And as a ranger in Olympic, I talked to many of the other rangers and they taught me about how Mount Olympus was formed. It's a big volcano. Um, they taught me about the rocks and I thought, boy, this is a lot of fun. I'm gonna go back to Princeton in the fall and major in geology. And that led to me getting a job with Shell Oil Company in New Orleans in 1979 when I graduated. And I loved working for Shell. I worked there for 33 years and then retired in 2012. After I retired, I thought I still want to do some work, but I want to do it in a different way. So I joined the boards of several oil companies, energy companies, as I refer to them. But I also joined the boards of some what we call not for profit companies. And that would be like the Houston Zoo that I talked to you about before. So I serve now as the board chair of the Houston Zoo. I've also served on the board of the Girl Scouts and the board of the hospital system here in Houston 
And most importantly, I'm no longer on the board of Springside Chestnut Hill Academy, but I was for many, many years. I think I got off the board a couple of years ago. So very much enjoy all my board work. But let's get back to talking about Shell. So how would you ever work for one company for 33 years and not get bored? And I think that this tells the story is that oil is an amazing, amazing liquid. And a lot of times, I think many of us don't realize how important oil is to this world. I bet you all know that you can take oil and separate it and you can get gasoline, which obviously we all fill up our cars with. You can get diesel that fuels our trucks, brings all our boxes from Amazon to our houses, or you can get jet fuel from oil and the jet fuel will fuel the helicopters that tie uh, flies in at Boeing or also all the planes that we fly around the world in. But what's more amazing is all the other things that if you break down that oil into all its different molecules, it is in almost every product. So look around your classroom and you will see that oil is used in the, in the varnishes and the coatings and the plastics on the tops of your desk. It's used in the soles of your sneakers. It's in the paint on the walls. It, when you take showers, it's in your shampoo, your soap. It's also in your computers and it's in the screens and the cases for your computers and the, the coating on all the cords from your computers. And just look around this picture. You can't even imagine if all these things left the world, what um, if we had no oil, we'd have no Legos, no plastic bags. Now we've had some problems with a lot of the debris created by oil, but I think that's something that we um, as humans can figure out. And as scientists, we can figure out how to clean up this world so that we don't get all the bad side of oil products. So let's go to the next slide. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what it was like to work at Shell. Um, as I said earlier, I was a geologist when I first started my career. So what does a geologist do? Well, that oil and gas sits in the rocks way deep in the ground. Sometimes it's 4,000 feet below the surface. Sometimes it'll be 8,000, 10,000, 15,000 feet below the surface. It can be below the surface on the land, or it can be below the surface out in the Gulf of Mexico, where we also drill for it. So a geologist's job is to draw a picture using a lot of information that you gather of what it looks like in the, in the subsurface, we call it, in the layers of rocks below the surface and tell the engineers where to put the drilling rig to go ahead and drill for the oil. We estimate how much it's gonna cost to drill that well and we ask our boss for the money to do it. And when they say, yes, you, they have money available, we move in the drilling rig and we work as a team um, to drill and uh, get the oil out of the ground. That oil will flow through pipelines to the refineries that you see on the right, all those big towers. And it's at those refineries that we boil the oil and pressure it up and separate it out into all those different molecules that we then make all those products. When I ran a refinery in Houston, it operated 24 hours a day and I supervised the 1000 plus people working there every single day. And that's one of the biggest challenges of the job that I had. And that is that a refinery uh, has to run every single day, every day of the year, even Christmas, and it never can break down. And so imagine if you had to run your car every day 365 days a year and never have it break. So we had lots of engineers at the refinery just doing maintenance work and ensuring that we would prevent any breakdowns. We also had uh, lots of engineers who bought the oil for the refinery and then figured out who to sell all our products to after we were finished um, making them at the refinery. So I loved my job. Um, at Shell and this in particular, after I ran the refinery in Houston, I had refineries all over the world. I had staff that worked in London, Singapore, and all those countries that Aaron mentioned in the beginning. 
I had so much fun traveling to those cities. And my favorite part was, was meeting the staff and getting to know their lives in those foreign countries because they were all wonderful people. So with that, I'll turn to the next slide and I'll open it up for any questions. Okay, a question that we have for you is, has the STEM field changed in any relation to opportunities for women since you first started working compared to today? Great question, thank you, Ayana. I think the STEM field has changed a lot for women. When I first went to Shell, they were just starting to hire women, but there were no women above me at Shell. So I worked for all men. And that wasn't a problem because they were all very nice to me. Um, they kind of treated me more like their daughter or the ones that were my age, more like their sister. But um, I didn't have any role models of women. And I think today, people like me who've been at the very top of Shell, um, we can serve as role models and encourage other women to come through the STEM field. Thank you. Another question we have is, what is your favorite part what is your favorite part of being a geologist? Oh, uh, being a geologist is really fun. Well, one thing is in school, um, I love the fact that the way we studied geology was we went on field trips. So we got to go to Northern New York State to um, see all the different rocks on the surface of the earth so we could better understand what they might look like underneath the earth. So traveling all over the country and learning about the rocks and seeing all these beautiful places was really fun. And being a geologist at Shell, I was able to apply all that knowledge, but I got to work in a team of people. And I think that's my favorite part is working as a team. What was your favorite memory at SEH? Oh, wow, my favorite memory. I have so many, I had such a great class, I think, um, one of them is that we started a lot of clubs, um, our class did, so that lots of students from different grades and upper school could join these clubs. And I started the Outdoor Action Club, and we got to go on bicycle rides to nearby parks and have lunches or get to, um, got to do things with our classmates in, in, you know, outside the classroom. And I think that's what was most fun. Thank you. And our next question is, do you have any advice for our middle school students? I think my advice for you is to um, stay curious about all the different things that you learn, not only in the classroom, but outside of the classroom and ask a lot of questions. How are these things made? What does this mean? Um, learn about uh, what you're told. Just don't accept everything that you're being told as as the facts, ask and explore your ideas and just enjoy that whole process of learning. Um, it's not just a chore, it's not just everyday misery with tests and things. It's really a wonderful opportunity to learn about things that uh, you may not have the opportunity to learn about in the future and make really good friends. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Smith Vins. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Michael Lamol. He graduated from CHA in 1987. He went to Harvard University for undergrad and the University of Pennsylvania for medical school. Dr. Lamol completed his residency and fellowship in the field of neurosurgery. He was an associate professor in chief of skull-based neurosurgery at the University of Illinois at Chicago as well as a professor and the chief of neurosurgery at the University of Arizona. Dr. Lamol now serves as a professor, vice chair, and director of neurosciences at Je uh, Thomas Jefferson University and Abington Hospital. Two of his four sons, Connor and Brady, are in the middle school here at SEH. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. So if we could have my first slide, I'll just give you a little bit of background. So I am I I joined uh, Chestnut Hill um, in my ninth grade class. So I didn't have that that long experience of uh, of being a lifer, but I still got so much out of the school, even in my brief short time there. And for me, a lot of that value was based on the academics. In fact, one of the reasons why I transferred in in ninth grade is because Chestnut Hill, as it was called back then, had such an 
excellent program in the sciences. In fact, um, I don't I don't know what you use the building for now, but our brand new science building uh, around the back near the gym um, was cutting edge. And so that was really important. But also the extracurriculars were critical. I, as you can see from these photos, I played football. I did track and field one year and I was terrible at it. I also played uh, ice hockey and I tried to start a lacrosse team, but that was before they had the lacrosse team. So that was not successful, but there were a whole host of other activities. And by the way, middle school, high school, this is the time to really explore what you love. I was in jazz band. I was in the players and did plays. I was on the school newspaper. I was part of student government. And at the, at the high school and middle school level, you can do a little bit of those. I'm gonna tell you, unfortunately, by the time you get to college and grad school, you really gotta stay in your lane. It's really hard to do all those things. So now's the time in your life when you really wanna explore those things and, and discover what you love. In addition to whatever you do for a career, those kind of activities will sustain you. So moving forward to the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about the journey of what it takes to become a neurosurgeon and some of the steps along the way and some of the exciting things we do that when we, in, in an everyday kind of setting. So you heard from my introduction, how I got there. It's really important in high school to apply yourself so that you can go to a college that, that will then feed you to a med school because it's very, very competitive. Beyond medical school, you have to go to something called an internship and that's where you're officially a doctor but you really don't know a whole lot. So you're learning under other doctors. And then you move on to something called a residency. And oftentimes the residency and the internship are combined. And again, same scenario here, you're learning your trade. I spent a total of seven years between internship and residency to learn how to do neurosurgery. It takes that long. And it's really, it's like the old apprenticeships. If you read about them in medieval times, you basically attach yourself to a group of doctors and they take you to the OR and you start working with them and for them. And by the time you're finished, you can do those operations independently. After that, I did some additional fellowship. I actually wanted to spend some time internationally. So I found a doctor in an area where I wanted to focus and spent about a year in, in Salzburg. And so the point I'm making here is that once you make the decision beyond high school to go down this track, say to becoming a neurosurgeon, it's about 16 years beyond your high school. So it is a major commitment, but you should not let that dissuade you. And that's why I have this, this quote here. Even when you're looking about looking at walking a thousand miles what you really ought to be focusing on is that next step you need to think about the thousand miles where you want to go if you want to become a neurosurgeon or a cardiac surgeon or a physicist or an engineer or a geologist you need to think about where it is but don't get overwhelmed by the length of the journey take one step every day and you'll get there next slide please now i'm hoping that these videos will play because i wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of well actually before that let me take a step back one of the things that I found so valuable at Chestnut Hill was the, the concept of the team. It might be the team in, in the players, you know, getting ready for that, for that drama presentation, all the actors, the director, the stage people, the people who put up the sets and break it down, the people who did the artwork on the football te team, on the ice hockey team, same kind of situation, really team is important. And in fact, I think you guys are getting a better team approach in the classroom for academics than even I did because I think education has shifted across the country. Back then it was very much, you do the homework and now I think they put teams together. And I, and I will tell you that's critical because when we look at something like I do like neurosurgery, not only am I focused in medicine on surgery, but then in neurosurgery. And then in neurosurgery, I'm focused on something called skull-based surgery, which focuses on tumors and defects at just the bottom of your skull. So I am so focused. It's almost like if you think about a horse with those things called blinders on, I can't really see a whole lot to my sides. So I have to rely on the people next to me, the medical doctors who treat heart disease, the ear, nose, and throat doctors who maybe treat the nose in the area where I'm operating. I show this picture of the Spartans. I don't know if you guys have gotten to the Spartans in your history yet. The Spartans were, were a Greek city state and they were known for their warriors, but they had a saying, and I'll explain this a little bit. They supposedly, the Spartan mothers would say to their sons who were the soldiers, come back with your shield or on top of it. Now, what that meant to be coming back on top of your shield is unfortunately your, your fellow soldiers would be carrying your, you home, you were dead. The implication was you should never throw your shield away and run away because it's not just like you were letting yourself down. Your shield was there to defend the person to your left. 
And if you broke the chain, you made the whole group vulnerable. And I love that image because it really does take a team. You play a critical part. And if you step out of your part, the guy next to you is vulnerable. And then the guy next to that person or, or gal is vulnerable and the chain just goes on. So I just got to emphasize this in medicine particularly, but I think in every field we're discovering that teamwork is so vital. Next slide, please. So a day in the life of a neurosurgeon, what do I do on a given day? Now, I'm a little different than the average neurosurgeon at this point, because once you sort of worked your way up to sort of a director level, I spent a lot more time in meetings and sort of not fun stuff. But what, what I did in my career, what my partners do is, is basically this here. So you get up early in the morning. So when you're one of those residents who's still learning, you might be getting into the hospital at 4.30 in the morning. As you get a little bit more senior, I, for example, roll in the hospital around 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning. And this means the morning round. So we check on the patients that we had come in overnight, that maybe were staying overnight. At that point, once we make sure there are no problems, we go to the operating room and do the kind of cases that we've either set up in advance or the emergency cases. Then maybe later in the day or on a different day, we actually see patients in the office. And this is seeing new patients who have a new problem that we have to figure out, or maybe patients following up, see how they're recovering from their surgeries. In all of that, particularly if you choose what's called an academic career in neurosurgery, you've got to find time to write papers and do research and teach those residents. And some of that teaching is in the OR where you teach them how to operate, but some of it's actually in a classroom where you literally give presentations like this one, showing them some of the techniques you, you know how to do. And then of course, there are always the business meetings. Uh, neurosurgery, like any other medicine, you know, as a doctor, you're also a business person. You have to, at the end of the day, make the whole plan work so that you can pay the bills, get the electricity going so that the hospital can still be there to serve everyone. And then of course, lectures and outreach to teach the next generation is really important. Next slide, please. So um, just to give you a sense of some of the things we do, I just have a little sort of smattering, a couple of very quick videos because neurosurgery is more than just, you think of the brain. It actually is an incredibly broad expanse. And that's one of the reasons I went into, neuro, I went into neurosurgery as opposed to say heart surgery. Neurosurgery, we do brain tumors. We do this skull base area, which is fixing holes in the base of the skull or traumas. We do spinal surgery. If you break your back or you have a disc that's pushing on a nerve, neurosurgeons do that. We do something called vascular surgery. So if you have a blood vessel that ruptures in the brain, we fix that. If you, we do something called functional neurosurgery. So believe it or not, unfortunately, when people get older, some of them develop diseases in their brain where it degenerates to the point that they have problems controlling their muscles. So for example, they may develop a tremor in their hand. We can actually put wires down in the brain that will shut off that tremor. It's really fascinating stuff. And as time goes forward, we're starting to treat other disorders of the brain like obsessive compulsive disease or depression with these wires. So it's an incredibly broad field. And so I wanted to show you some of this. So for example, if you can just click one forward in this slide, this is an example of the skull base. And this is what I do, a skull base neurosurgeon. So if I know where the base of the skull is, because your bones don't really move in your face, I know where the brain is because your brain doesn't really move so much inside that casing. You hope it doesn't move. You want it to sort of stay put. And as a result, over the last 20 to 30 years, neurosurgeons and our ENT colleagues, that's the nose doctors, have come up with some really clever ways to get to the brain without cutting in the traditional sense. So if you can hit click the next um, button, we can actually bring cameras right up the nose and get to these critical areas. And that's one of my areas of specialty. So the patient doesn't have any scars externally. We have a lower footprint, but we can be just as effective taking out tumors or fixing holes and things like that. So that's an example of skull-based surgery that's pretty exciting and really sort of futuristic. Next slide, please. Another area in neurosurgery that we do is called radiosurgery. Now it's a little bit of a, of a false name here because it's not real surgery, we don't cut. But the idea is that we use focus beams of radiation that come together from multiple angles and add up at one point. And it's a really high dose. So we gotta be right. In fact, the original radiation that people started using almost over 100 years ago, you sort of gave a broad dose to a general area. It wasn't as important. Now, because we can get that high dose, it's like a heat-seeking missile. Neurosurgeons actually invented those machines, and we are involved in that planning. If you can go ahead and click and see if this video plays. We're oh, can you go back again and just um, maybe try moving on that video and clicking the video? Hmm. Maybe not. Um, so neurosurgeons will actually um, pl help plan those. 
Uh, I had some other videos, but for some reason they didn't translate through, but that's okay. Uh, showing just different aspects that we talked about, the treating the blood vessel diseases, the brain tumors and things like that. But suffice it to say, what's exciting about neurosurgery is not only are we treating so many different problems, but we have so many advanced cutting edge tools. And if you're at all technologically inclined, fantastic field for that. Next slide, please. So again, the take home message is neurosurgery, it's a lot of hard work. Um, and it's very challenging. You're going to be challenged intellectually, an incredible amount of data you have to incorporate. You're going to be challenged when it comes to budgeting your time and, of course, developing an endurance. I, you know, I, re I remember putting in, you know, days 40 hours without sleep. I remember putting in weeks, 120 hours uh, in the whole week. And there are, there are safeguards now to make that training less severe. But the truth of the matter is if you're a neurosurgeon, you're working in Montana and someone comes in with a, a bleeding in their head, it doesn't matter how many hours you've been working. If you're the only person around, you have to do what you have to do to save that patient's life. Again, I wanna emphasize that great variety and the great rewards and that stamina that's necessary. And so let me move on to the next slide. The last thing I do wanna add is that along the way, just because you're in a focused career doesn't mean you can't stop and smell the roses. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy what you're doing, but enjoy everything around you. And for me, that's been family around me. In fact, my kids who are at SCH, uh, enjoying them and, and having time to interact with them. Uh, the, the pictures on the right side I show there, because it just was one other detour along the way. While I was a resident, while I was learning neurosurgery in Phoenix, I had the opportunity to sign up as a flight surgeon in the Air, Air Force because we had a major air base that was flying F-16s, two-seaters, so I got into them about once a month. Um, and basically, I could do this on the side and become a flight surgeon. I could serve my nation. I would go one weekend a month. I would go and do readiness and preparedness for the team and prepare my hospital group. I got the, the personal benefit of being able to fly. Um, but this was something that did not conflict with my training. And I could still enjoy it and branch out. And for you, it might be something completely different. It might be playing in a competitive tennis league, as some of my partners do here. Um, but find those things that you enjoy in life, uh, no matter what it is you have to have those sustaining, sustaining aspects of your life outside of your career. Because at some point, your career will change or you will retire. And if you don't have those kind of activities that still stimulate you, it's going to be very difficult. So with that, I'll say thank you and I'll take any questions. Um, our first question is, do you do mostly planned or emergency surgeries? So me personally, um, I take about... Um, about a week's worth of call, but we're a, we're a subspecialty group. So if I'm on call and a person with a spine problem comes in, I don't do that anymore. I do it emergently. So if you need a spine problem fixed that night at three in the morning, I'll take care of it. But if it's something that we need to plan out and get the robot involved, multiple levels, then I'll hand that to my spine partner just like they'll hand a skull base case to me. Um, so the answer to your, to your question is yes, I do emergency surgeries, but more often I try to route them and they try to route them to the appropriate surgeon with that particular area of expertise. Our next question is, what is the longest operation you've ever done? So the longest one I have ever done would probably be on the order of 14 to 16 hours. Um, and these are very difficult tumors behind the ear. And not only are you taking out a tumor that is, you know, literally that big, but you're trying to take it out and save the nerves for hearing if you can, the nerves for balance, the nerves for moving your face. And of course, something called the brainstem, which is about as thick as the fat of my thumb here that connects the whole brain to your spinal cord. So really critical. And those are operations that are very painstaking and slow. Um, I know of colleagues who back, say, in the 80s, when we didn't have as detailed MRIs and CAT scans, who would do certain operations that could last 24 or 28 hours. Um, but that's less common, thankfully. Our next question is, what made you want to be a neur neurosurgeon? So a couple things, and I'll relate this back to Chestnut Hill. I think having teachers who really stimulate you is critical. I actually thought I wanted to be a physicist. Uh, because I had a fantastic physics teacher who was also my advisor, Marty Bomberger. Um, but I also loved my, my biology teacher. And I also had some doctors in my family. So I was able to sort of bounce those off. And the real, so even by the time I went to college, I was still thinking about, okay, maybe I'm going physics. Uh, then I took quantum mechanics and that all changed. But uh, 
Suffice it to say, it's that love of, and, uh, of, the, of the sciences that, that is stimulated early on. And then why did I choose neurosurgery once I went to medicine? Well, I like working with my hands. I'm a little bit uh, the kind of personality that needs immediate results. And surgery gives that to you. You do the operation, you know it's a technical success right afterwards. And, and within a day or two, you know if it's been a functional success and did the patient get better. I think, I think being a, a, a family practice doctor or an internal medicine doctor it takes a little longer to see those results. You start a new medication, maybe it's months or even years before you see the result. That's just me personally. And then neurosurgery, particularly because I love that breadth of, uh, you know, at least when I was training, I love the fact that it covered so many aspects of neurologic health. Now, like I said, in my career, I focused down, but I think early on the, the, broad, the broad scope of practice really excited me. Um, another question we have for you is, have you ever seen Grey's Anatomy? Is it anything like real life based? Is it anything like real life based on your experience? Um, yeah, I have seen it. And funny story, one of my partners in my last job in Arizona was the primary neurosurgical consultant for that movie, or for that, for that mini, for that uh, TV series. And so they'd call him up and say, is this correct? I think there was one episode where Dr. McDreamy like used a handheld drill to put a hole in someone's head right down there in the ER. Uh, no, that doesn't happen. Um, but we do drill holes in people's heads in the ER to put tubes to relieve pressure and so forth. We just don't do whole operations down there. Um, but it, it, so they get some things sort of right in the sense of what we can do in neurosurgery. It's just the, you know, like any movie, they compress things into a, a 30 minute bit. So it's sort of, it's, you, can, you can watch it all. No one's going to put a seven year neurosurgical career on a screen, on a, on a TV. But uh, yeah, they get some things right, and it was informed by science, but it's a lot of it's sensationalized. Did you ever want to quit or give up? So it, it's not that you want to quit. I think it's you go through an evolution, at least I have as a surgeon, where you want to evolve and you want to start moving up. And for me, that was going from being a broadly trained neurosurgeon to one who focused on skull base and then, and then administratively moving up to becoming a chief of my, of my division and then a chair of my department. Now I'm a director of not just neurosurgery, but neurology and a neuro, the, the stroke uh, team as well. And actually, I'm, I'm in the process of doing my master's of business association, my MBA, they call it, um, because wanting to take it to that next level. So it's not that you want to give up. You sort of want to slowly over time change your job description, not to throw anything away, but to expand on it, I say. What was your favorite memory at CHM? I have a lot of great memories, but I would say that most of them relate back to the friendships I formed. Um, I think there was a there was a slide that got dropped um, where I there, there were four of us uh, at graduation and believe it or not one of those fellows went off and he was my roommate in college um, and then he went into a career that was very similar he went to ear nose and throat surgery and as a skull based surgeon I operate with those kind of guys all the time he's now the chair of neurosurgery at the University of Maryland so our careers have been very parallel we talk to each other regularly he's still my my best friend. And though that friendship started because I was at Chestnut Hill, believe it or not, this is a true story, brand new kid, ninth grade, I show up to football camp. And if you, if a uh, tie, if you remember football camp, you showed up three weeks early and you lived in the gym. And I met this guy named Rod, Rod Taylor. And he walked up to me, you're the new kid. I'm Rod. And he just started taking me around, introducing me to his friends. I remember what struck me most. I went home and told my mom, I said, mom, I met this really cool kid, Rod, who went out of his way to introduce himself. And he brought his Bible to football camp. I said, that's an amazing kind of guy who knows who he is and what he, and what he wants to be about. And that relationship has persisted from that time. And again, it was, it was Chestnut Hill and now SCH that really sort of fosters those relationships where you can carry that forward. And I'm, I'm blessed to have had that. What is the hardest part of your job? I think the hardest part, and, and this is getting sort of difficult, so, so if I don't say this clearly, let me know, is when you fall short of what you need to do, and in patient care, that means when patients don't have the outcome you want. So you do your best operation, and they still don't get better, or sometimes they even get worse. I always tell all my trainees, you will, through your life, you will hurt people not because you're negligent, not because you're a bad doctor, not because you're a bad person, but because people are not put together like cars. You know, it's a challenge every single time. 
and we do our best job and we have to struggle with that. And I've, I've, like anyone else, I've struggled with those cases. And the good news is I had mentors, chairman above me, uh, chairs above that, deans above that, who would talk to me. And one of them said something very clear to me. He said, Michael, no matter what, if you are an arrow, even if you miss the target, you're still an arrow. And what that means to me is don't define yourself by your daily successes and failures because you will have failures. You'll learn from your failures. Define yourself by what you choose to set out and, and intentionally do that day as a surgeon, in my case, or as any career. Define yourself internally, not by what goes on around you. And that's really hard, but you'll get through it. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamol. Uh, and thank you to all of our speakers. We're going to turn it over to Ms. Brown now, who was our Director of Alumni Development here at SCH to kind of say some parting words, wrap up. Thank you, Catherine. I'm just bringing my, <laughs> getting myself back on again. <laughs> Hold on one second, I'm so sorry. No worries. All right, I have to get my, okay. Ayana probably knows why I can, I'm trying to get myself back on again. Well, we can see you. Okay, oh, you can, okay, great. Wonderful. Okay, so anyway, I was just gonna say, um, thank you again so much to our wonderful alumni, Ty, Stacy, and Michael for taking the time out of your busy day today to talk with our middle school students about your careers in STEM. Um, I hope that maybe some of our students will decide to maybe go into some of the fields that you all have chosen. Um, and I also hope that there were some takeaways from what I heard that you all said that I think can carry with you each day. Um, find your passion and enjoy it. You all have so many opportunities in the middle school. So I think that is something that you could really um, do. Um, also stay curious, explore and ask lots of questions, which I know as, as many teachers that are watching, I know that the students ask many questions. Um, and also I think as um, Dr. Lamola said, enjoy the journey. You know, you get, you um, day to day get caught up in doing your, um, your profession, but you wanna also enjoy the journey as um, you are traveling through life. So I think that all of those were great takeaways for our students. And once again, I thank you so much um, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Bye everyone.